Good evening. I'm Hari Srinivas and Judy Woodruff is away on the news hour tonight. The new tax law and its impact on tax deductions in states with high property taxes. Then on the leading edge of science with a doctor on a professional and personal journey to find solutions for America's addicts. The first thing that, that you do when you feel that that problem is there, please don't judge. Recognize that that person inside of that addiction is still your son or daughter or brother, and they have behaviors they can't control. And the year in technology, we review a turning point in our lives online and in social media. I think we got uh, justifiably a lot less optimistic about tech and a lot more um, worried about uh, the implications of a few big tech companies kind of taking over much of the world. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. A cold wave kept the nation's Midwest and Northeast in the deep freeze today. Wind chill warnings and advisories stretch from North Dakota to New Hampshire as Arctic winds dropped temperatures to 37 below zero in some places. Officials warned of the risk of frostbite with less than 30 minutes of exposure and they went on alert. Anytime that we have an extreme in weather, be it cold or hot, it, uh, it, it taxes the EMS system as a whole. Look for people who may need assistance maybe before they're so bad off that they, they require an ambulance to go to the hospital and they'll get them services like a shelter or a detox or things like that. As the cold set in, Erie, Pennsylvania declared a state of emergency with a record 65 inches of snow. More snow was falling today. In Syria, critically ill patients are finally being evacuated from a rebel-held area near Damascus. Hundreds of sick people in eastern Ghouta have been unable to get treatment at area hospitals, but now government troops are letting aid groups evacuate nearly 30 critically ill patients. In return, the rebels want a like number of captive fighters released. Also today, Russia declared the main battle with the Islamic State in Syria is now over. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said the Syrian army and its allies must turn their focus to hunting down the Nusra Front Group linked to al-Qaeda. Russian leader Vladimir Putin has officially registered to run for his fourth term as president. In Moscow today, Putin handed in his papers in person to the nation's election commission. Early polls show he's likely to be reelected in the March vote. Opposition leader Alexei Navalny is urging a boycott of the election after he was banned from running. Today, he called for nationwide protests next month. Let's come out to the street for yourselves, for your rights, for your future, for the fact that we do not want to lose another six years. We will start a big campaign on one hand to persuade everyone to participate in the boycott and not to take part in the election, and on the other hand, to count how many people really come to the polling stations and not let Putin fabricate that number. Putin is 65 years old and has already led Russia as prime minister and now president for a total of 18 years. Former President Obama is urging leaders to be careful in their online statements. He spoke with Britain's Prince Harry in an interview that aired today on the BBC. The former president did not directly mention President Trump, but he did voice concern about social media's effect on politics. All of us in leadership have to find ways in which we can recreate a common space on the Internet. Mm -hmm. One of the, the dangers of the Internet is, is that people can have entirely different realities. They can be just cocooned in yep. information that re reinforces their current biases. Mr. Obama also said he considers the Affordable Care Act, widely known as Obamacare, one of his greatest achievements. The Library of Congress says it will no longer archive every public tweet, including the president's. Instead, starting in the new year, it will be more selective. The library cites the growing volume in tweets and the increase in characters from 140 to 280. The National Archives keeps all presidential tweets and will continue to do so. And on Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 28 points to close at 24,774. The Nasdaq rose three points, and the S&P 500 added two. Still to come on the news hour, should you pay your property taxes early? We look at the pros and cons under the new tax law. A nation divided, a review of the year in politics from the right and the left. America addicted, a doctor's personal loss to opioids, and much more.
The new tax laws are set to take effect on Monday. Given that the president and Republicans in Congress just passed and signed the legislation days ago, some taxpayers are scrambling to try to squeeze in deductions, some for next year before 2017 ends. That's especially true in a number of municipalities where people are standing in line to prepay their property taxes for 2018. Let's look at what you need to know and begin with this field report by Brenda Flanagan of New Jersey Public Television. While Republicans celebrated and called their tax bill historic, homeowners panicked and called their accountants in high property tax states like New York, California, and New Jersey. Phones and emails have been going off crazy because a lot of people are hearing about the real estate tax deduction, hearing about all the changes, and wanting to know what to do. That's because in 2018, the Republican bill will cap property tax deductions at $10,000. But in Jersey, average property taxes exceed 10000 in four counties. In fact, homeowners here pay the highest property taxes in the nation, more than 8500 bucks on average. Anyone in New Jersey, that's got to be scary. So many homeowners like Wayne DeFeo are meeting with CPAs looking to prepay next year's property taxes to take advantage of the full deduction before it expires. It's kind of a loophole. If I could prepay half of my property taxes for next year to take advantage of it in this tax year, based on what my accountants told me, is I would save almost $1,000. And that goes to my pocket. It's up to each and every taxpayer to make a decision how comfortable they feel paying real estate taxes in advance. But you should look at it. Everyone should look at it, because it's a one-time opportunity by December 31st. It's a lot of money to leave on the table. How much? Say you're single with no kids making $75,000. Your property taxes are $20,000. We figured that for 2017, you'll owe the IRS about $8,500. But prepaying the first two quarters of your 2018 property taxes could knock that IRS bill down to about $6,000. You'd save almost $2,500. But accountants advise it won't work for everyone. For people that make more than $200,000, they're caught up in alternate minimum tax, which basically disallows income and real estate taxes to get you back to a minimum level. CPA Dan Connolly also warns some people may be tempted to borrow money to make those prepayments. Some people are going on credit lines to pay for them, and then they're going to have to pay interest on the money that they borrow to prepay the tax. So the calculation is not that simple. Regardless, municipalities from Elizabeth to Alpine and here in the short town of Belmar report residents are showing up with checkbooks to prepay at least the first two quarters of next year's property taxes. We're working them through the process of prepayment. Um, we have our staff ready to accept those prepayments, process them properly, make sure it's all documented for anyone who comes in so that they're able to take advantage of the deduction this year in 2017. Mayor Matt Doherty's prepaying his taxes, but besides working the loophole, lawmakers in several states are also looking for other ways to soften the blow. Here in Jersey, one bill would increase property tax deductions for homeowners, but it would cost the state $170 million in revenue. Well, the bill will allow full deductibility of uh, uh, homeowners' property taxes on their state income taxes, and that will cut in half uh, for most people, uh, the hit that they're going to get by the Trump bill, which uh, does not allow deductibility for property taxes over $10,000. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Brenda Flanagan reporting from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Some more questions and perspective about the changes to the tax code and end-of-the-year decision on property tax deductions. Mark Stieber is a CPA and chief tax officer for Jackson Hewitt Tax Service. So, Mark, what are some of the factors that should go into figuring out whether you should make these payments now versus later? Well, your piece was excellent and spot on with several of the observations from some of your uh, professionals. Basically, uh, don't think that one size fits all on this opportunity. It certainly works where it works, but where it doesn't, it can have the benefit of biting you pretty badly on the back end. So uh, the two things that I'm telling folks on this property tax acceleration idea is, one, uh, make sure you have the money. Borrowing money to do a tax planning idea that might change even after the first of the year, uh, not my best advice. And the second thing is watch out for 
with that alternative minimum tax. Your other featured speaker said that these taxes are not deductible when you go in and compute that, uh, as are not mortgage interest and a whole host of other items that you do to calculate alt-min tax. So if you make this accelerated deduction, throws you into alternative minimum tax, and you don't get a benefit, all might have been for naught. So have the cash, uh, watch out for alt-min, but most importantly, what we're telling our clients at Jackson U is to consult with your tax advisor. O only they know your facts and circumstances and what to watch for and what your tax profile will look like for 2017 and for 2018, even given the new limitation on the property taxes. There's a lot to look at, and you certainly don't want to run afoul of a benefit that you might need next year, even if you're in a high property tax area. You know, one of the things that we heard is that this is going to affect states like California and New Jersey, but this isn't a blue state, red state thing, is it? No, it's not, and that's really kind of a mischaracterization. Those states that you named certainly do have high property taxes, but I'm from Florida, and I have friends in all the different states in the country, and many of them have high property tax locations. So it's, it's really for anybody who has high property taxes, they should look at this, but they should also look at their other factors as well. But this is not solely a New Jersey issue or a California issue or a New York issue. It's a, whoever has property taxes more than $10,000, the new limit, uh, that's where this is kind of applicable because that's where you're going to get capped out in 2018. But what about the possibility that Congress could move forward to try to close this loophole retroactively, saying everybody that went out of their way to stand in line and pay these now might not actually see the benefit? Uh, you know, that's certainly a possibility with the corrections bill that'll come in after the fact to tweak up some of the areas that were not, you know, absolutely looked at in, in totality when they passed the, the law. But I wouldn't really worry too much about a retroactive change unless there's a great deal of abuse. And I think once folks take a look at this and see, you know, what some of the risks are, what some of the costs are, I don't see this really being an overwhelming, uh, you know, opportunity for folks to take advantage of. It's a lot of money up front for a tax benefit, arguably in, you know, 2019 when you do your taxes, you really have to have a compelling set of facts and circumstances to do that. And, yeah. and you know, some will do it, and it will make sense, but most people are taking a cautious look at the idea. But where it makes sense, it makes sense, but it's not for everybody. All right, Mark Steber of Jackson Hewitt, thanks so much. Thank you. Taxes were just one of the top political stories of 2017. John Yang now takes a deeper look at President Trump's first year and what's in store for 2018 from two different perspectives. All right, we're joined by Karine Jean-Pierre, who's a senior advisor to MoveOn.org and a contributing editor to the online women's magazine Bustle. She also served in the Obama White House. And from Phoenix, Chris Buskirk is a radio host out there and editor of the conservative blog AmericanGreatness.org. Chris, Karine, thanks for being with us. Chris, I want to start with you. You talk to, to folks out there on your radio show every day. As we end the year, what's the, the sort of the state of the Trump base, of Trump supporters out there now? Well, a lot happier than, uh, than I think folks were maybe even two, three weeks ago. I think the, uh, the fact that the tax bill passed was, uh, was a welcome balm at the end of the year. There was, uh, there are two, and there are two elements to that. One is that uh, people generally support the tax bill. They think it was good policy, and that's a big part of it. The other part is just as seeing a Republican Congress for whom so many Trump voters had very, very high hopes at the beginning of this year, and seeing that Congress actually do something. Uh, you know, I've called it a do-nothing Congress for months and months and months primarily because it was a do-nothing Congress, but they, they did something, and I think it was good policy from our perspective. And, uh, you know, as we're, as we're uh, wrapping up the year here, the Trump voters look at this and saying, you know what, the president did um, uh, a lot of things he promised to, and uh, now we're actually seeing Congress get on board, too. Uh, Chris, I want to c continue with you. you. As you pointed out, there was a lot of unhappiness about Congress. People were still supporting the president, and they were blaming Congress for, the, for inaction. Has this solved all that? Is the, 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 and also, has the, the gap between the president's supporters and, uh, for lack of a better term, the elected officials in Washington, the uh, Speaker Ryans, the uh, Leader McConnells, has that been healed over by this? 
You know, I don't. I don't know if it's healed over, but it's a. But it's a good start. I guess I'd put it that way. You know, there's been uh, there, there's been a sort of changing of the guard uh, going on on the American right among conservatives over the past year or two, or even three. I guess if we go back to 2015, and uh, is everything uh, brushed under the carpet? No, but you know what? That that's okay. I mean, what's what's important here, from my perspective, I think from a lot of people's perspective on the on the right, is that uh, is that different factions within the Republican Party are figuring out figuring out number one that they. Need to work together, and number two, how to do it. And so, yeah, as we go into 2018, that's a reason for people uh, on the right to uh, have some optimism. Kareen, conversely, what's the sort of the state of the of the loyal opposition yes, as we conversely, end the year? Conversely, indeed. Um, look, I think that Republicans uh, pass an unpopular bill now that they have to go into 2018 trying to sell it, and not only that, they have a president that's historically unpopular. The Republican Congress is unpopular, so they are facing potentially a blue wave next year from the Democrats. Uh, uh, and I just don't understand how they even think this is a good thing when you see the polling after polling that says people hate uh, the GOP tax plan and also the intensity. There is the, an intensity on the Democratic side that we have not seen in a long time. They are unified. They are energized. Democrats won a Senate seat in a ruby red state of Alabama. That is unheard of. That People would say we had no business uh, uh, even going into that state and trying to fight and win that race. And so I think that Republicans have a tough fight against them, uh, ahead of them in 2018. And I just don't see how they even stop that. Unifying right now doesn't even make sense either because they have a unpopular president. Congress is unpopular. And let's not forget, there's DACA that needs to be taken care of. There's CHIP that needs to re be reauthorized. Both bipartisan uh, policies, programs that are popular. Yeah, Chris, what about that? The, the Democrats. There's a lot of talk about whether the Democrats have, there's an enthusiasm gap with the Democrats, that they are more enthusiastic, more fired up going into 2018, going into the midterms. What about that? Well, there's something to it. There really is. And I, and I think this is going to be a hard-fought election year. There's no doubt about it. Look, there's something about being in opposition that tends to that tends to galvanize the people who are in the opposition. Republicans just had eight years of it. And in, I think by uh, by a lot of measures, we're more successful, you know, as the, the old mantra goes, the Republicans are the party of no. Republicans were pretty, got pretty good at being the party of no uh, during the Obama years. And because there is something that brings people together when you think that you are, or actually are in reality, in the minority in Congress. So, as we look at, at the elections coming up next year, yeah, Republicans do need to figure out how to, number one, stick together, and number two, how to make the case. I'm happy to make the case that says, look, we have a booming stock market, we've got low unemployment, we've got, uh, we've got a tax bill that allows people to keep more of what they earn, we've got more or less peace abroad, and uh, make that case to the American people in 2018. But you know what? You have to make the case, and that's going to be the challenge for Republican candidates all over the country next year, because there is a lot of enthusiasm on the left, and so I say, you know, let's have at it. Kareen, it, it, that's the, the making a case for the Republicans in 2018. For the Democrats, do they have to say, I mean, what's the, what's the better politics for them? To stand and say no to the president, to uh, be the opposition, literally the opposition, or do they look to work with him on the issues you talked about, DACA, yeah. uh, the Dreamers, uh, the children's health insurance, uh, I infrastructure? Right. So what I say to DACA and, um, and CHIP is that, look, it is a bipartisan uh, 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 support. It has bipartisan support. It's, pro it's very popular with the public. So it should be able to be fixed easily. It, it's not very difficult. And not only that, Republicans control all three branches. So they should be able to do that. And if they don't, it's not the Democrats' fault. It is the Republicans' fault. So that's that's that point there. But I do agree that Democrats need to not just be anti-Trump. They need to also offer something as well, which is, OK, let's lift minimum wage. Let's fight on that. Let's make sure we expand Medicare, expand Medicaid, expand Social Security. Let's be, be, be about something, not just anti-Trump. Chris, are there places where the, the uh, Republicans, Republicans can work with the Democrats in the next year before the elections? Yeah, I th I'll tell you what. I, this is a place that I'm really interested in. I think there are two uh, there are two big areas where uh, Republicans and Democrats hopefully will be able to find some common ground and come together. Number one is infrastructure. This is something that has been talked about by people like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi for a long time. It's also something that's been talked about by Donald Trump. He actively on the campaign trail was talking about a big infrastructure bill. I think that would be uh, more than appropriate, more than welcome in 2018. I, I would hope there would be some uh, consensus on that. And and the 
other part is, uh, and this really, this really is big picture, but I think it's important, and, and that is returning uh, the power to legislate, to make laws back to Congress. I think Congress needs to take some of that power back from the executive branch. I think altogether too much lawmaking power resides in the agencies uh, and the departments of the executive branch. And this, I think, particularly now with Trump in the White House, this might be a time when uh, Democrats and Republicans in Congress can say, you know what, we need to go back to doing the job the Constitution gives us, which is being the legislature, being the one that makes the laws. Chris Buskirk, Corinne Jean-Pierre, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Stay with us. Coming up on the News Hour, a treatment to eliminate a female medical problem and with it a cultural taboo. The year in tech when social media companies came under scrutiny, and from the News Hour bookshelf, the real life story of the infamous Miami drug war. But first, we continue our second look at a special series, America Addicted, on the opioid crisis and its enormous toll. Tonight, the story of a doctor who suffered a devastating personal loss to opioids exactly one year ago. But now he's doing everything he can to keep other families from suffering the same fate. Miles O'Brien reports that at the same time, he's also concerned about a backlash where some patients can't get the pain treatment they need. This is part of our weekly Leading Edge Science Series. Spend the day with physician Jim Baker, and you will understand America's opioid crisis in a uniquely professional and personal way. He lives in Holden, Massachusetts, a Norman Rockwell town just north of Worcester. Idyllic as it seems, there is death all around. On the time it took us to go around this block of a minute, uh, including my house right there, four deaths and one uh, person in recovery. And so this, this is Holden. Less than a year ago, death by overdose came to his family. He lost his son, Max, or Mackie, as his family called him. He was 23. Mackie was a sensitive, caring, warm, brilliant young man. He was so smart, it was scary. <laughs> He always enjoyed music. Uh, yeah, he, he uh, started playing seriously when he was about 10, mm -hmm. and he would play every day, multiple times a day. And because he was the drummer, the band played here. Jim Baker can remember the night things changed. I was up in this room. They did the first half of their set, which was clear and strong music. Uh, then they took a break. When they came back, they were the timing was off. The it was the the changes weren't right. I thought, what happened? I found out later that that they had gotten a hold of pills, and within a year, uh, he had moved on to heroin. How that happened, I still don't know. And so began a downward spiral. He was flunking out of school, losing friends, and his music deteriorated. He had the deepest desire to stop. He knew, he said, if I don't stop, it's going to kill me. But he couldn't do it on his own, and I couldn't find treatment. He was trying to find a fellow doctor willing and able to give Mackie treatment with Suboxone, a combination of two drugs. One answers an addict's craving for opioids, the other blocks the high but precious few doctors provide the treatment. The sad truth is they say, I don't want those patients in my office. Or in more private conversation, it takes too much time, I don't want to deal with it. I've heard people say, our group talked about it, we voted against it. There's no reimbursement. Jim Baker spent many years as an emergency room doctor and now works for hospice. He makes house calls to people who need opioids to manage their pain. Today, he is checking in on Bob Hopwood. Do you feel like when you use it, if you just had a little bit more, it would help you? He works hard to ensure his terminally ill patients avoid unneeded suffering with pain. Physicians are over-tuned to this. And uh, what's happening now is physicians are say, responding by saying, I'm writing for fewer opioids. I don't write for opioids anymore. And, and it's having a negative effect for people who have real pain and who need relief. Now they can't find it. 
the pendulum has definitely swung back too far and now people who really have pain cannot find relief. But he understands all too well the crisis that has caused this overreaction. As his son's journey into the darkness of addiction worsened, Jim Baker felt he had no choice. He told Mackey to leave the house, which prompted this letter. I, I said, Mackey, you can call me anytime, 24 hours a day, no matter where I am. I will help however I can. Just stay with it. I love you so much, Dad. He did stay with it. He finally found treatment, and he got off the heroin. He was able to maintain sobriety for two years or so, and he was doing great. He was in college. He had fallen in love. He and Emma were planning on getting married, a storybook ending. It seemed like he had beaten the odds, and then Thanksgiving last year, a horrible twist of fate. It was late at night, and coming down this road, his impact was right here, boom. A young girl, we guess, just didn't see him coming because of a, a bush or a house there. He fractured and, and deformed his right hand, his drumming hand, his writing hand, and uh, then he was bruised up in his chest and his face, and uh, he was beat up pretty, pretty good. As he went into surgery, Mackey told the anesthesiologist not to give him opioids. But uh, I found out later she was injecting him with fentanyl. And uh, when he came out of the operating room, the first thing he said with glazed eyes is, I need drugs. Addicted once again. A month later, he got the call he had been dreading for years. This is the road I was driving to when uh, his brother called me and said, Dad, Mackie's unconscious. And I was coming up here hoping and hoping, please, Mackie, please. I uh, couldn't get the door open. And I'm asking him, is he breathing? Uh, is he responding? And uh, the answers were really scary. He was gone, one of 33,000 Americans who die each year because of an opioid overdose. So we're coming up upon the cemetery. And the field right above that is where he learned to play t-ball. Hey, Mackie, Dad's here. Just want to tell you that I love the pal. <laughs> We're going to keep on fighting. On this night, they gathered at a health club in Holden. They peddled hard to raise money for the Max Baker Foundation, and they heard Jim Baker's talk, poignant and practical. My goal is to have everyone here know more about opioids than they did when they came through the door. He told a rapt audience what to look for, slurred speech, pinpoint pupils, and long sleeve shirts. The first thing that, that you do when you feel that that problem is there, please don't judge. Recognize that that person inside of that addiction is still your son or daughter or brother, and they have behaviors they can't control. He told them to get Narcan, an over-the-counter drug that can instantly counteract an overdose. It's a, one of the few miracle drugs I've ever seen. The person is blue, not breathing, dusky, even cool, dying. And get Narcan in and three, two, one, they sit up and go, what, what? where am I? So, and he told uh, them to get a sledgehammer. And if I hear a funny sound in the bathroom or a thud and knock, 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 and there's no answer in there, I'm going to pick this up and I'm going to whack that door handle. Then I'm going to whack that hinge and I'm going to bust down that door and get in. This is Jim Baker's mission, his way of channeling profound grief. I feel like what would it mean to me had someone who was suffering done what it took, done what was necessary to help Mackie? And I, I would be forever, I am, I can't really talk about it, but the most meaningful thing I could ever ask of someone, 
but it's now my turn to do it for somebody else. And I know that's what he'd want me to do. Max Baker is no longer with us, but his father is spending his days hoping to make sure his son's life has enduring purpose. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Miles O'Brien in Holden, Massachusetts. Tomorrow, a report on the impact opioid addiction is having on the American workplace. Find all of our stories from the series online at pbs.org slash newshour. Next, one effort to address a humiliating medical injury that afflicts perhaps one million women in the developing world who lack access to safe medical facilities. Fred Sam Lazaro reports from Kenya. It's part of his Agents for Change series. In a new hospital in Eldoret, Kenya, these women are awaiting surgery to fix a condition that's widely misunderstood and reviled, one that's made them outcasts, often in their own families. It's called obstetric fistula, an injury to the birth canal caused in most cases by prolonged labor that leaves a woman incontinent. Perhaps one million women in the developing world suffer from fistulas, a condition virtually wiped out in industrialized nations with better access to prenatal care and medical facilities. At least once a week, these patients hear a message of hope from a woman who knows all too well their suffering. 41-year-old <laughs> Sarah Omega was just 19 when she was raped and became pregnant. I was so scared. I didn't want to uh, secure an abortion because of my faith. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I kept the pregnancy. Omega eventually spent 38 hours in a difficult labor, much of it at home. In the process, the baby died, and she suffered a large fistula. For 12 years, Omega says, she was subjected to isolation and shame. I attempted suicide twice. Every night I would go to bed. I would say, God, please don't allow me to see tomorrow. Because my tomorrow, every day, I would wake up in the morning, see the sun, I would cry because I knew it was another day of pain, of humiliation, of suffering in isolation. That anguish landed her in a psychiatric ward, and it was there that a visiting doctor came to her bedside. He assured me that uh, my problem was going to be fixed, and um, I remember that day he told me, I am seeing a lot of hope in you. I want, I want you to get, uh, to get healed. That doctor was 49-year-old Hilary Mabea, a gynecologist and surgeon who has devoted his entire practice to women with fistulas. This 88-bed hospital was built for his use as part of a broad campaign by the California-based Fistula Foundation. These are patients who need um, care, they need uh, support, they need uh, a lot of counseling. I, I, and they suffer so much from society because of their condition. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly how many women suffer from fistula in this country, in part because most of them are kept isolated by their communities and even their families. But in recent years, since the campaign began to raise awareness of fistula, awareness that it is treatable, some 7,000 women have emerged from hiding each year seeking surgery. <laughs> fistula awareness groups have taken to the streets to educate others about the condition and where to get help. We watched as these women, many of them survivors themselves, fanned out through the western city of Mumias and encouraged women suffering from incontinence issues to get free screening offered by the campaign. <laughs> Organizer Habiba Mohammed said people have many misconceptions about fistula. Maybe she has been bewitched, maybe she was promiscuous and had a relationship out of marriage when she was pregnant. Mohammed's group, Wadadia, recently arranged the transportation and treatment for 35-year-old Rachel Juma Wasamba, who lives in a remote village in western Kenya. Wasamba was lucky. Her husband stayed with her throughout her condition and treatment. Many husbands abandon their wives in such situations. Amina Musheli says that's what happened to her. 
My husband couldn't take it anymore, so he left me to marry another woman. She had surgery one year ago and now makes and sells goods in the town marketplace. Using skills she got from a training program sponsored by Wadadia, the training ranging from hairstyling to seamstress work and computer skills helps reintegrate women back into their community. The moment this woman has been treated and she has healed, you can be able to see a significant change in her life, and not only in her life, in her family, in her children. So it has a ripple effect to entire family and the entire community. Back in Eldoret, Dr. Mabea is kept very busy at one of the few places where fistula surgery is performed and offered free of charge. Working six days a week, he operates on 45 women a month. Since that's just a fraction of the new cases, he's also training other doctors in the region. And he's working to prevent fistulas in the first place. Fistula is almost 100% preventable. In uh, developed countries, that problem is not, it's not even there. He says fistula can be avoided if adequate prenatal and emergency care is made available when complications arise during pregnancy. More than half of all Kenyan women still deliver their babies at home. For her part, Sarah Omega says her healing became complete when she was able to give birth to a healthy baby daughter, Jade, who recently turned two. She means just the whole world to me. I remember at some point I would, uh, I would pray and say, God, if you give me a baby, that baby will erase the pain I've gone through in this life. And Omega continues to help other women erase the pain of fistula. I decided to change the pain I had gone through into something beautiful, something that will help me reach out to other women, something that will and allow other women to live a normal life like me. She travels frequently to talk about her experiences, but more regularly, her advocacy happens at the bedside of women at the new Fistula Hospital. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Fred DeSam Lazaro in Eldoret, Kenya. Fred's reporting is a partnership with the Undertold Stories Project at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. Technology has traditionally been seen by the public and many in the media in a more hopeful light. But 2017 felt different, a year that frequently cast technology and its unintended consequences in a much harsher light. In a moment, we'll have a conversation that I recorded last week in New York. But first, a quick reminder about some of the major problems this year. Russia used Facebook and social media to try and influence the 2016 elections. The revelations reverberated throughout the nation's capital this year. As congressional Exhibit committees two, detailed, Russian operatives bought ads that sought to capitalize on racial, religious, and political divisions in the U.S. Just 120 fake accounts posted on Facebook 80,000 times and reached as many as 126 million Americans. Facebook's CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, initially doubted that the platform could have influenced the election, but later to pledged to make political advertising transparency. more transparent. Not only will you have to disclose which page paid for an ad, but we will also make it so you can visit an advertiser's page and see the ads that they're currently running to any audience on Facebook. Members of both parties were angry at the company's slow admission, but the focus grew beyond just one company to other tech giants since Russian agents use Twitter, Google, and YouTube too. The Senate Intelligence Committee grilled top lawyers for the companies. Many of us on this committee have been raising this issue since the beginning of this year. And our claims were frankly blown off by the leaderships of your companies, dismissed, said there's no possibility, nothing like this happening, nothing to see here. Hacking, a perennial problem, took on new urgency this past year. The ransomware cyber attack called WannaCry temporarily crippled computer systems in hospitals, banks, and companies around the world. More than 230,000 computers in 150 countries were affected. Just a week ago, the Trump administration named the country it says was responsible. After careful investigation, the United States is publicly attributing the massive WannaCry cyber attack to North Korea. We do not make this allegation lightly. We do so with evidence and we do so with partners. 
Hackers also tore into Equifax, one of the largest credit bureaus, stealing the personal information of more than 145 million people. They got social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, and driver's licenses. The tech industry faced a new conversation on inequality by race and gender. Susan Fowler, a former engineer at Uber, published a damning account of a harassment-filled workplace culture. Uber fired 20 employees, and it eventually helped lead to the CEO's resignation. She told Time she was amazed by the reaction to her essay. I expected it would be like a 24-hour, you know, like viral thing, but it didn't slow down at all. And I was reading through all these things, and I thought like, oh my gosh, like I'm not alone. Others like Ellen Powell, who filed and lost a gender discrimination case against a powerful venture capital firm, said change was needed. Well, I think if playing along means, you know, participating in sexist and racist jokes, that expectation has to change. The year ended with a divisive decision by the FCC that many fear will lead to the end of net neutrality. The idea of treating all content on the web equally without charging more or blocking your ability to see other content. For a closer look at the potential turning point that 2017 is shaping up to be for the most well-known tech giants, I'm joined by two people who follow that world closely. Farhad Manju is a New York Times columnist who writes on how technology is changing society and business. And David Kirkpatrick is the founder of Techonomy. He's a technology journalist and author of The Facebook Effect. Thank you both for joining us. So, uh, Farhad, let me start with you. Um, how did tech shift in our perception this year? Yeah, I think we got... Uh, justifiably a lot less optimistic about tech and a lot more um, worried about uh, the implications of a few big tech companies kind of taking over much of the world, much of our communications, much of uh, um, how we kind of learn and experience the world, all of our personal information. Um, and I think the tech companies responded to that. Um, they started to notice, I mean, uh, after the questions about the Russia hack, after questions about um, sexual harassment, um, they started to respond to these criticisms. And I think the key change they made was um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the big tech companies started at first grudgingly and then um, more willingly, I think, um, they started to accept that they have some responsibility to the rest of the world, that their technologies aren't um, necessarily kind of neutral platforms and uh, that they have some responsibility to kind of police what happens there. Um, how that plays out, I think, will be the big question of 2018. Um, but this year, I think that the, the big change is that in the past, um, technology companies sort of thought of themselves as kind of neutral. And, and I think that started to change. They're less neutral now. So David Kirkpatrick, what happened to make Silicon Valley less the sort of darling of well, Washington, D.C., as well as Wall Street. Well, if there's one single thing that changed the situation, I would say it's Russian fake news affecting the election uh, in the opinion of and, and the desire of Russia to alter our electoral process and using Facebook and Google, but Facebook in particular, as a key means of doing that. And I think what that concern at a national level did was draw attention to the extraordinary social, cultural, and informational weight of these companies, and then caused a lot of people to start asking bigger questions about what it meant that these very small number of tech giants have had such a monumental impact on our social dialogue and have, in effect, become the central platform for social dialogue and increasingly, in many ways, for political uh, behavior as well. Mark Zuckerberg famously said it's a crazy idea that they would have had any impact on the U.S. elections. And then since then, he's made several statements that walk that back. Right. He said that to me on my techonomy stage at 2016, two days after the election, in which, by the way, I also asked him if Facebook had special responsibilities because of its scale, and he essentially demurred on that. Uh, so, again, while I agree with what Farhad said, it's really notable how much he has changed since then. I think Dave is right. Mark Zuckerberg has changed in a way that I've been surprised by. When he started Facebook, the main sort of idea behind Facebook was that he wanted to kind of connect the world. Connecting the world, he argued, was enough. And that was kind of the general feeling among others in the tech industry, that just sort of building the technology, the technology itself would kind of help people, would uh, democratize the world. Um, and now 
the thing that Mark Zuckerberg talks about is uh, not just connecting people, but creating meaningful connections. This is a meaningful is a word he's been using more often lately. What that means exactly is not clear, uh, but you know they plan to change uh, the Facebook news feed uh, mm -hmm. to address some of these concerns, both the fake news concerns, but also this idea that Facebook might be kind of um, putting us into echo chambers, kind of splintering much of uh, our dialogue. Well, Farhad, how much of this has to do with who is designing the underlying technology in the first place? This is a, a big problem for them to solve. The big tech companies are all based on the west coast of the United States, you know, several here in California and then, and then a couple in Seattle. Their sort of workforces kind of look the same. They're not very diverse. They're not gender diverse. They don't have a lot of minorities. They're not kind of class diverse or geographically diverse. And they are increasingly gatekeepers for information for not just the United States, but the entire planet. And so you really have this question where there are a small number of people who are essentially homogenous, um, kind of making decisions for the rest of the world. David Kirkpatrick, what's the likelihood then of these technologists attacking the problems that are underlying this, the diversity, the lack of transparency, uh, and the ultimate consequences of the tools that they build? Well, I think there's no question there is a major shift underway in the mindset of the Silicon Valley uh, workforce and the leaders of these companies that they have to do that. However, uh, as Farhad's written and as I firmly believe, it is an extremely challenging project to understand the true weight of these massively important systems in our society and how to actually more effectively manage them. I mean, it's a question of governance, in effect. And the reality is when the public square is, in effect, dominated by commercial enterprises, um, who should regulate that is entirely undetermined. Clearly, these people are starting to recognize if they don't take actions that appear to be in the public's benefit, they will become regulated by government, both in the United States and abroad, and that process is happening much more in Europe already. Uh, they want to desperately avoid that. On the other hand, the ideas aren't really even there on their part to, uh, as to what really could be done to properly regulate the flow of information, given their fundamental goal of selling advertising to make money on these services. Because advertising effectively requires eyeballs and attention, and they uh, still are more in the mindset of drawing attention than they are of doing the right thing, in my opinion. All right. David Kirkpatrick of Techonomy and Farhad Manju of The New York Times, thank you both. Thanks, good to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Finally, in the latest edition of the NewsHour Bookshelf, Jeffrey Brown examines the wild west that was Miami Beach, where cocaine cowboys played and died. Al Pacino's gangster snarl in the film Scarface. Say hello to my little friend! How much time we got? 25 minutes. The oh-so-cool undercover detectives in Miami Vice, the popular culture images of Miami in the 1980s when cocaine drug lords helped make it the murder capital of America. The real-life story is told in the new book, Hotel Scarface. Author Robin Farzad is a business journalist, host of Full Disclosure on NPR One, and occasional contributor to this program. And it's nice to talk to you, Robin. So nice. We usually talk about economics, but here we are. Why this subject? Why did you want to go look at this story? My heart has been with this for, you know, in the 22, 23 years since I left Miami to go to college. Uh, when cocaine came to town, it was so ridiculously profitable. It was so seductive. It made people do such crazy things in the name of money and power and bloodlust that you had something approximating a failed state by 1981 in Miami. The epicenter is this hotel. It's, uh, you, you nickname it Scarface Hotel, right? But, it, but it's the mutiny was the real place. That's right. It was called the Hotel Mutiny at Sailboat Bay, and yeah. um, the first three floors had a club, a private discotheque, a restaurant, a lounge, a tiki bar, and it was just infamous. All the celebs who would come to Miami, I mean, Fleetwood Mac, The Cars, um, Crosby and Nash recorded a song about the place. Uh, mm -hmm. Neil Young would be there. It was kind of the, the closest thing to Miami's Studio 54 at the turn of the decade, 1979, 1980, well before South Beach had arrived on kind of the global 
hotspot scene. So the celebrities are there, but if but it's the drug lords and the gangsters, that's where the, a lot of the action is. It's 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 the ecosystem of all that money that was mm -hmm. there, money and sex and cocaine and aspiration. I can't. I, I mean, in the case of um, the Cuban exiles who came to this country penniless, who. Uh, really wrested control of the cocaine trade by the late 70s and didn't mind being seen with the most gorgeous models and, and Playboy casting calls and yeah. powerful housewives and Richard Nixon's friends. Uh, everybody largely left everybody alone until all of Miami blew up. So your book is filled with all these colorful characters, colorful but violent characters. Sure. Pick one. Tell it just to give us an example of somebody that kind of grabbed you. I, like many people in Miami, am haunted by the specter of one Ricardo Monkey Morales. Monkey was his nickname. This is a guy who worked for Fidel Castro, became disillusioned uh, with the violence and the revolutionary cause, was ostensibly flipped by the CIA, brought to Miami in the anti-Castro cause, and was really raring for a rematch. And when we had the Bay of Pigs invasion, and that fell through, literally all of exile Miami thought that it was fait accompli, that that Kennedy would finish the job. But mm -hmm. then Kennedy didn't finish the job, and, and Kennedy dies, and LBJ is looking at Vietnam, ultimately. And so you have all these orphaned people, all these bombers and mercenaries and CIA-trained CIA trained people like Monkey Morales who are uh, kind of rudderless for the 60s and 70s. And first pot happens, yeah. and it's child's play for them to move marijuana because the CIA trained them to know evasion on the coastline better than anybody else. And then cocaine is multiples as profitable. And even though Morales was shot and killed in about uh, Christmas of 82, his ghost lingers. Mm -hmm. And I think he is a metaphor for everything that went wrong between Cuba and the United States. This is a person who was a romantic. He read uh, history books. He quoted Casablanca. He cried whenever it came on. But he also knew how to strangle people. He got away after shooting and killing several people. He, yeah. He was an informant. He hunted Nazi fugitives, helped the Mossad. I mean, imagine his LinkedIn profile. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, if I ask you about what surprises you found along the way, I, I mean, maybe frame it in terms of those cultural references I, I started with. I mean, did they get it right when we look at Scarface or Miami Vice? What did they get right? What, what did they exaggerate? What's shocking to me is you can be meeting with ex-cons, people who've spent, say, you know, upwards of 25, 30 years in prison, and they've now reintegrated back into Miami life, mm -hmm. and they're having early bird dinner with you on Coral Way or somewhere in Little Havana, and they're like, nine out of 10 times, like, you know, Tony Montana's based on me. Me, I always tell the truth, even when I lie. The town rebelled against this entire concept of Scarface coming there to film in 82 and 83. They saw it as an affront to the exile community until it became this pop culture totem. So say good night to the bad guy. And then everybody after the fact was like, it was based on me. I had a leopard. No, it was based on me. Look, his throne looked like mine. And I believe that he was a composite that, that Oliver yeah. Stone and De Palma saw at this hotel. Well, what ended it? What brought this era to an end? It just became so violent by 1981. Um, it was fun and games in the sexy and swinging 70s, and people got along. The Colombians came in with a shot across the bow in, in uh, 1979, the Dadeland Massacre. And then once the Mariel boat crisis happened and you had 120,000 refugees end up in South Florida, maybe 10,000 north of them criminals, many violent criminals. Yeah. It was every man for himself. And that's when the Miami Police Department, the DEA, the FBI, it became a national security concern for Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan and Morning in America. I mean, after all, he deputized George Bush Sr. with his South Florida Drug Task Force. So when the feds got serious mm -hmm. about it, I think all the fun and games and the, the, the hyperbole of it was, was shut down. But what's amazing to me is that it, it's very much a, a story that still exists in Miami's psyche and, and, and the Pan American psyche if you talk to people in Colombia and Panama and uh, Venezuela. All right, the book is Hotel Scarface, Robin Farzad. Thanks very much. Thank you. Author Robin Farzad shares more books explaining Miami online. It's on our website. A clarification and follow-up to our tax story tonight, courtesy of the National Taxpayer Advocate, Nina Olson. The IRS announced today taxpayers will only be able to deduct their property taxes for the coming year on their 2017 returns if and only if their 2018 taxes have been assessed by their local government. If taxpayers make payments on unassessed taxes, they will not be able to deduct them.
And that's the news hour for tonight. Tomorrow on the broadcast, the fight over Medicaid expansion in the state of Maine, the voters against the governor. For all of us at the PBS News Hour, thank you and see you soon. You're watching PBS.